All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you. Welcome to all of our locations. We're coming to you live right here from Washingtonville. Thank you for being here, especially our guest. Uh, lucky you. We're in our series finale. So what a message to be here for this weekend as we've been in a series called You Are Here. And what we've meant by that is confessing and admitting where we are in our own personal lives so we've talked about shame and fear. So I am here today and I am here in fear. I'm here today and I'm here in hurt or guilt or shame. And that's the journey we've been on for the last four weeks. And then I think today is going to be very helpful, if not victorious, I hope, for so many lives and hearts. So before I jump in, I want you to check out, check out this picture here. Now, at face value, just looking at that, it's a very beautiful image, one of nature's wonders that, as, as you see it there. But if I was to zoom out on it, you get the full picture, here's what you'll find. It's a tar pit. And so the thing with a tar pit, I learned, is that you can walk across it and get away with it. But if you walk too slow, you'll start sinking. If you stop, you'll really start to sink. And then the more you try to get out of it, the further you will sink. Uh-oh. I wonder who I could be talking to today, and perhaps that might sum up your life, that you're treading across places you shouldn't be treading across and getting away with it, so to speak. Or maybe you have found yourself stuck, and you're beginning to sink, and you're it's getting over your head, and you're starting to try to claw out, but it seems like the more you claw out, the tougher it is. So that's why you're here today, and I'm glad you're here today. That's why I'm glad I'm here today with you, because God has a word for all of us. If you feel stuck today, that's what we're going to dig into, is being stuck. But being stuck, how? So let me run over a few thoughts with you to think about this, because this is not an addiction message, although it captures it as well. It's about... Anything you and I run to, to try to feel better. And in the end, it's something you and I do compulsively, whatever that may look like for you or me. We do it compulsively over and over again, hoping that we'll feel better, in which we do not, yet we keep doing it. So you can look at this in terms of, in terms of habits and addiction. So habits is a pattern behavior. Addictions become an obsessive behavior. And it often comes through us trying to cope, to cope with ourselves, to cope with life, to cope with our past, to cope with our shame, to cope with sin, sins we've done, cope with sins done against us. So it's something we do over and over again. And, as, and even if it's a habit, starts as a habit, it can be strengthened into cravings. And what's sinister about this all, for us all is those cravings remain despite the behaviors we do that no longer feel helpful or feel good, yet the cravings remain. And it doesn't have to just be drugs or alcohol. It can be all kinds of means. It can be overeating. It can be perfectionism. It could be a, a slew of things. But it's things we turn to to cope with self and life. What about triggers? What triggers are in your life to trigger you walking across the asphalt pit or tar pit or stopping there? I call them B-halts. I don't know if this will be helpful to you, but this is what I think about in terms of when I'm vulnerable and maybe when you're vulnerable to the tar pit. B stands for bored, when you're bored. The H stands for hunger in terms of your appetite. This could be a sexual hunger. It can be a relational hunger and, and bad kind of ways, bad hunger kind of ways. The A stands for anger. If you're, in, if you're angry in conflict, you, you don't want to feel that. Or you're anxious is the other A, anxiety. You're trying to feel anything but an anxiety, especially a social anxiety. Or loneliness, you're lonely and this is how you cope. Or you're tired and we're all tired. Anybody got an amen with that? We're all tired. We're all exhausted. So tired can be a trigger. S is shame. Shame is the brute. That's why we spent time on that last week. Shame. All these can be triggers. So then it brings us to the question, how can we have victory? Are you walking across the tar pit today? Have you, have you stumbled into the tar pit? Have you stopped? Are you sinking and you can't find your way out? I also want to say, do you have a loved one in that place? But I want to keep it personal because we're all on the tar pit in some way, in some fashion. 
and the Lord is going to show us how to be free. So let's pray for just that. Holy Spirit, dependent on you. Nothing in my, nothing in my mind or through my lips is going to help anyone. You are our hope. So Spirit of God, would you speak through the Scriptures, speak through your servant, the words of God, the words of hope, the words of second chances, the words of healing. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So as I looked at this, I love preaching through Scripture verse by verse by verse by verse. But sometimes we'll tackle subjects where you, it's topical, where instead of having a Scripture we talk through verse by verse, we'll look at a, an issue and then pull in biblical principles from around Scripture, around it, to have a guide so this, the Lord can guide us. So that's what this message, the series, has done. So looking at an issue and then pulling Scripture from around it in their context to understand where we can find victory out of the tar pit. So here's the first step out right here, and it begins with your heart. Surrender your heart to Jesus. Now you may think, well, I'm born again. I've already surrendered my heart. No, you still preach that gospel to your heart every day. Every day you got to look at your heart and say, yeah, I'm born again, but where's my heart today? What am I giving my heart to today? What am I looking to to numb or to escape or to cope with my life? What is my heart seeking? So if I was to talk about addiction, I would strongly suggest that addiction is, is not a disease. Addiction is sin. It talks about sin reigning in the mortal body. Romans chapter 6, we go to James chapter 1, it says our desires are that which gets us toward death because out of desires we have temptations and we go for the temptations which leads to sin and which leads to death. Because if anybody buys into addiction being a disease, you are now a victim and you're not a victim. So there's hope here. And the reason we understand it to be sin is that it's a worship disorder. Because in the end, when our heart looks to something or somewhere else to cope, to find our meaning and value and worth, we find a worship disorder. It's, an, it's what the Bible calls an idol in our lives that we can actually sacrifice to. So let me show you out of this passage here in Psalm 106. It says, They worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them, and they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods. That's so applicable today. So the idols that you worship, it's that which you pursue or that which you reach for to cope with life, to escape, to numb, or to get past any emptiness or to get past the boredom, the hunger, the anger, the anxiety, the loneliness, the fatigue, and the shame. And you can sacrifice sons and daughters. It traps you, first of all, that, that bad habit all the way to an addiction, and then you sacrifice on it. So if, you know, if you're a shopaholic, for example... Well, you're most likely sacrificing your financial life on the altar. If you run to any other bad, look at that in your life, which brings adverse consequences. If it's a bad habit to a behavior to, to a way of living, if it brings adverse consequences, look who it's bringing consequences to. Maybe it's the son and the daughter. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your finances. Something's dying on the altar if Christ is not the heart of your life. So that's where it all begins. Before any ministry here in which you want to serve you, don't begin with the ministry. Whatever program is out there that's wonderful, and there are many, don't begin there. Begin with your heart. It's a disorder in the heart. But here's the good news. You ready for this one? If you worship yourself into something, you can worship yourself out of it. So where will you go to worship? You worship Christ. Watch this. 1 Peter 3.15, worship Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's where you go. Because if money ends up being the Lord of your heart, you're going to tend to be stingy and insecure. That's how you know you got an idol there. You're sacrificing something as an idol. If your physical appearance becomes your heart, then you will be self-absorbed, always comparing yourself. Or if control happens to be the idol of your heart, you'll end up being manipulative and, and, and potentially abusive. So instead of that being your heart, give Christ Jesus your heart. Make him the center of your heart. He's safe, and he's victorious, and he's the king, and he's the one worthy of your heart and your life. He is worthy and worth it all. Jesus said to deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow him. 
And it's, it's tough to let go of things that we already follow and things we already hold close to in our hearts. I heard this podcaster this week say it this way. I'm going to be sure I say it right. He says, everything we let go of has claw marks in it. But it's about letting go and surrendering our hearts to Christ. This is the way Jesus put it in John chapter 8, verse 34, in this heated argument. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And then he follows it up with this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Oh, come on now. Now, there are many ministries here that will set you free. There are many programs out there that's going to set you free. But I know you don't want to be free. You want to be free indeed. And the only way you are free indeed is through Christ Jesus. So it can't begin with a checklist of what you've got to stop doing and start doing, although that's very important. We're going to get there. It begins with Christ, Christ in your heart born again, and then preaching that gospel to you every day of your life, that he be the heart of your life. That's the first step from you are here to go there with Christ. Second step out of, it, out of the tar pit is to take responsibility for your life. Take resp- don't just take responsibility over whatever it is that you're doing or behaving or the ways you're living. Don't just take responsibility over that. Take responsibility for your whole life. Take responsibility for your health. Take responsibility for your reputation. Take responsibility for your spouse and your marriage. Take responsibility or for your future spouse or future marriage. Take responsibility for your finances. Take responsibility for your whole life. And here's the kicker. You don't have to do it on your own. I call it God's grace, your grit. God's grace, your grit and taking responsibility. Where do we see this? In Philippians chapter 2. He says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's your grit. That's my grit. Work it out with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you and me both to will and to work for his good pleasure, his grace. So when you hear grace, think divine enablement. God brings divine enablement to you, but you also have to have a radical commitment. Divine enablement, radical commitment to take responsibility for our lives. Now, let's get practical. I read this, this verse in Ezekiel weeks ago, and literally I thought, i got to shoehorn that verse in somewhere. i gotta find somewhere. I got to find a sermon where that's going to go. And here we are. Here we are. Here it is. Listen to this amazing verse in Ezekiel chapter 3. If righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore the obstacles I put in their way, they will die. That's quite a word from God, from the prophet, but this is what I really want you to pay attention to. And ignore the obstacles I put in their way. What a God. God is so for you. He is so for your victory and to get you out of the tar pit. He personally will put obstacles in your way if you're paying attention. All right, so here's... (laughs) Here's, some, here's the way to think about it. It's the only thing I can really think about that hopefully you can rabbit trail it out and how it apply to you. But say your, your, your desires start craving and you're craving to go to that certain store to buy that certain thing and your craving drives you and so you get in the car and there's that love-hate relationship with it, right? I don't, don't want to do this. I want to do that. I don't, but I do. And so you're driving to the place and you get to the store and you get out of the car to go purchase what you shouldn't purchase and you can't find your wallet. <laughs> God just put an obstacle. He made you forget your wallet. Now here's the kicker. Are you going to ignore the obstacle and go to the car? And I had a 20 in here last week. I'm going to look under, are, are you going to get in the car and drive all the way back and, oh, I forgot See, it's not about just the obstacle. It's recognizing God did that. God did that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I will not ignore the obstacle because you're for my life. See, you got to take responsibility. Even how God brings grace, you got grit. Now, let's talk about the issues, ways, behaviors that we do have a love-hate relationship with. 
Let me show you how Paul does this. So we're all in great company. If you have a love-hate relationship with, with something with adverse consequences in your life, Paul too. Watch this. The Apostle Paul, Romans 7. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I'm the only one in my heart saying amen and amen right now. Nobody's saying amen but me. All right, there's two of you. Good. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, Paul is not saying, he's not making an excuse saying, you know, this is just how I'm wired. This is taking, up, taking me over and there's nothing I can do about it. No, it's Paul in the battle of himself. He, in a sense, it's like he stepped out of himself and he's watching himself going, why am I doing that? Ever been there? You stand on the outside of yourself and you're going, why did I go there again? So you're in good company, y'all. This is God is for you. He speaks practically right to you and me. He gets it. He knows the struggle. So Paul says, this is, I'm looking outside of myself. And why? Then he goes, but I love God. I love God's word with all my heart. But there's this other power in me that is at war with my behalts. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. <laughs> Preach, Paul. So you kind of it kind of smells some guilt in Paul here as he's unpacking this. And I thought about it, I thought, you know, when we feel guilty, it's really a lot easier not to do the click. Right? When you feel guilt, you, you, you're, it's a little easier not to take the extra slice. When you feel guilt, it's a little, a little helpful not to take the next drink or to make the purchase with a little guilt. But here's what guilt does not do. It does not take away the craving. It does not take away the affection for it. And what happens if you're like me is then you start second guessing. So I have a, I have a shopping purchasing problem to try to bury my shame and try to, you know, I'm bored and I'm hungry and I'm anxious and I'm lonely and I'm tired and, 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 and the purchasing, the shopping is the thing. And deep down you're like, I got to do something about these credit cards, but I don't. And then you think, uh, I, got, I, have, I need some accountability in my life because this, these ways and this behavior is out of con control or starting to get out of control. I'm starting to sink in the tar pit. And I really should go and just kind of put, put, put it all out on the table. But I don't want to put everything out on the table because I still want to have my options. I should cancel the subscription, but mm, that's, a little, that's a little too far. So this is what we do. We second guess, don't we? We second guess these things. And it could be that we're sinking in the tar. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, let's look where, where Paul goes. I mean, it's not, we got to even be careful of saying, if I can just get better control of this, if I can get better control of this, then I can everything in moderation. If I can just get control of it. But we don't see Paul doing this. We see Paul getting to a space and a place here where he has this love-hate relationship, but he doesn't stay stuck. How does he get unstuck? Here's the verse, how it finishes out. Who will free me from this pit? <laughs> Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, it always comes back to Jesus. It always comes back to Jesus. There's this passage in John chapter 5 where there's this, it says he, he was a man who was an invalid and he was by this pool. And if you could get into this pool when the waters were stirred, it was believed they would bring healing. Well, this man had been an invalid for 38 years and he never could get to the pool. So one day, Jesus, out of everybody laying there trying to get to the pool, he walks around everybody right to this man. You know what he asked him? He's asking him what he's asking you right now. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And then some interchange, and Jesus said, take your mat, get up, and walk. God's grace, your grit. Jesus brings into your life this healing his grace, his divine enablement, but you got to get up, take your mat, and walk. 
So this is an encouragement to receive divine enablement through the Spirit of God. But take your mat and walk like you're free indeed. Because you are. Trust Him. Move. It's not about... It's about progress, not perfection. Some of you have come so far. Some of you got a rough, a rough deck of cards. You have, can you have biological dispositions toward addictions? Absolutely. I do. I'm sure almost every one of us do. And it's what, like one psychiatrist said, it said that, I'm not sure I said that, say this right, genetics, genetics is the gun, your lifestyle is the trigger. And so it's taking all of that in and saying, yeah, this may be true, and that is true, and my disposition and all of this is true, and my bents, but this I know. Christ is for me. His grace, his divine enablement can free me. So everybody, I'm going to pick up my mat, and I'm going to walk. Now, I may have to crawl every now and then. I may have a bit of a limp. I may trip over my mat, but off I go. Do you really want to get well, or are you going to second guess? See, it comes down to you, his divine enablement, but, his, but your grit as well. So that's the second step. Take responsibility. Third step, seek community. Seek community. Now, I may push my G's a little strong here, but, but just so, so you can remember it. God's grace, your grit, others' grip. Because you need others to have their lives into your lives, to take a grip on your life, to help you away from the tar pit or to help you out of the tar pit because when you fall into the tar pit, you're good. If you, the harder you work, the deeper you're going to go. So you need Christ to come in and begin to pull you out. And your grit means you're not resisting. You're not thinking this is my life is the tar pit. No, you, you're surrendering. And then there's also the hands of Christ of other people around you who want to serve you and love you out of that tar pit as well. Do you know in, the, in Alcoholics Anonymous and their wonderful 12 steps, do you know what the first word is of the first step? We. We. And he followed on out and talks about we and our lives are now unmanageable. And then we is uh, implied through every step. Wonderful. They're on to something. It's something the scriptures have taught us for millennium, right? It's, it's that we need each other. Community. Even scientifically. Psychiatrists, psychologists, about anyone, in, about any, from shame to addiction, it can only, you can only thrive and flourish within a community of people who share this with you. So let's go to Scripture. Watch this in Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, Christ, he may strengthen y'all. That's a plural you, by the way. So I'm going to read it, y'all. He may strengthen y'all with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So let me just be clear. We're not talking about a higher power. We're talking about Christ. So whatever program ministry you're a part of, it's not about some power. It's about Christ. He's the one that brings the freedom. And a y'all with Christ dwelling deeply in the heart through faith. And he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together. If you like writing in your Bible, if you even if you might have the phone, digital stuff, I have that underlined, power together, power together, power together. With all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's some huge, huge truths right there. So how do, you, how do you experience something that surpasses knowledge? How do you experience a love, wide, high, long, deep, that surpasses, surpasses knowledge means it got to your knowledge and it went further, meaning it goes from knowing to experience. So it means you truly want to experience the fullness and the greatness of the love of Christ. you got to do it together. That's where we find it. Now, what might that time look like together? James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I love how this says, or how it doesn't say, therefore, confess your sins to each other so that you may be forgiven. Because it's not about forgiveness. It's about you're already forgiven. There's forgiveness in the room. 
It's in the space. It's in the relationships. So it's going further. It's saying to confess shame stories, struggle stories, vulnerable, being vulnerable and transparent. And then you pray. So it's not just a story time. You pray for each other that you may be healed. There's the kicker. I learned this a long time ago. You're only as sick as your secrets. And you're only as free as your confession. And this is what the Lord is driving us toward, to stay out or get out of the asphalt pit. Then I just, I'll just take a moment here. I don't have this on the screen, but this one verse. I'll be sure we hit this because it matters who you hang out with. It matters who you spend time with, whether that's social media or in personal relationships. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, Let those who say, let's feast, and eat, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die, do not be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Huh. You know, I, I've said this to my kids before. You know, if you've got three or four people on the ground, and you stand up in a chair, and you think you have it in you to pull those, let's just use one person. If you stand up in a chair and reach down to try to pull that person up, how far are you going to get pulling that person up? It's impossible. You're going to get pulled off every time. So beware that you hang out with people and thinking you're in such a place you can help them out of the tar pit. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 18, 24. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Now listen to this. This is the New Living Translation. There are, and it's got it in quotations, there are friends who destroy each other. Are you in a relationship and you are destroying each other? Here's a way to think about it. I have two daughters, so I'm going to be a little harsh for a moment on the boyfriends for a second here. <laughs> Ladies, if you have someone in your life who puts destructive things in your life, you need to get out. Because it's, it's just a foreshadowing of the future to come how you're treated, how they treat, their, how they treat their mama, and what they put in your life. Is it something to build you up, or is it something that will eventually wreck you? And I can say it the same for the girlfriends to the fellas. Same. Or for any friendship. Here's another way to think about it. Again, I'm not dealing with addiction, but let me just use, only addiction, but think, let's just use drinking. If you have a group of friends or a friend, and you get together around drinking, what is that friendship really made of when you pull out the drink? Is there still the relationship? Is there, or put anything else in that place. What do you have? And here in Scripture, we find if you want to take responsibility and get out of the tar pit, you don't need to swim in the tar pit with everybody else. But look to Christ who will pull you out and those who really love you, who will reach down in the tar pit together to pull you out or to help you out as a community. I'm not going to be pastor of the week this week, I know, so let me keep going. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, just to nail it. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other out of the tar pit. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but if someone who falls alone in the tar pit is in real trouble. Community, we need community. God's grace, your grit, others' grip. Yeah. So the fourth step out of this asphalt pit is to reorient your days. Reorient your days. And I mean that specifically, your days. Specific, what do you do when you wake up and how you do your life and live your life through the days? Watch this. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the word, notice the word lure and entice, lure. It's a fishing word. It's a fishing lure kind of word. So there, I know this is really too small for the cameras and many of you, but it's a fishing lure, right? Very enticing, this lure. If I'm a fish, mm, looks good to me. Right? It's a nice and wiggly worm, and it's got these little shiny pinky things on the end, these spinners. Mm, mm. But see, this, <laughs> this, uh, this might not be attractive to you, but it is, you're a different fish. You like a different, you like the red worm, right? So every, in other words, everybody has their own lure. 
You have your own bent. There's something specific to your life that is very attractive to you, makes you crave. Do you even realize what that is in your life? Do you realize what that lure is in your life? And it's to recognize it and to, and, and to, to say, I, I need to stay away from this lure because I need to believe that in the end, it, it's not about what it looks like, though it looks good on the end of it, is the hook, right? There's always the hook. And that hook will ensnare me and drag me off to death. So do you realize what the attraction is? And you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says that God will not allow you and I to be tempted beyond what we can bear, but yet provides a way of escape for us. So whenever you have whatever this is that is almost unbearable in its temptation, you've got to recognize it in your day and plan around that. So, you, so if God, you can't say, God, you promised me not to be tempted by what I can bear, but you're right here. God, you promised. <laughs> God, you promised. Like you're smelling it, your, mouth, your mouth's open. God, you promised. And no, no, you should have avoided that about 50 feet back. Reorient your days around what can lure you and entice you. Think about what can trigger you in here. Is it certain friendships that bring this over into your life more and more? Is it going down a certain grocery aisle? Is it social media? Is it films? You can, be, you can see films and this be in the film, right? Or in the music. You hear it and it starts doing something within. A, it starts luring. And let me take it another level because Jesus does. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. <laughs> Jesus said this. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And throw it away. Boy, Jesus is dramatic, isn't he? I mean, think about it. Why did Jesus say gouge it out and throw it away? Why didn't Jesus say if your eye causes you to sin, you need to close your eye and turn around and go in a different direction? No, he said gouge it out. Oh, and throw it away. I mean, this is some kind of language. Oh, and then he goes further. He says if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And throw it out. Boy, this is, what do we do? What is Jesus saying? Now, he's not saying, well, pastor told me to. He didn't, he's not talking about that. And he's not, because think about it. You could gouge your eye out and cut off your body, but you could have lust raging in your heart still. So it's something more than that. Remember, we got to go back, surrender your heart. But what Jesus is saying is, when you have these sins, the, the, uh, the temptations, the lures in your life, you need to alter your life dramatically. You need to start doing your daily life in a completely different way. So what, where, where, where might that start? Well, first of all, maybe you need to stop buying these lures and putting them in the cabinet Maybe you need to stop buying them and having them in your house, whatever that is for you. But I know the love-hate relationship. I'll talk about cookies for a minute. <laughs> I, I, got a big, I got more issues than cookies, but let me just... Actually, it's crumb cake. So, Chrissy, go to ShopRite for crumb cake. I don't know if you've ever seen a crumb cake at ShopRite. It's that much crumb and that much cake. I love it. So much crumb. So I said, babe, I call her up and say, hey, babe, why are you there? Will you, uh, <clears throat> will you buy that crumb cake? And then she'll come home, and I'll say, well, where's the crumb cake? She said, well, I forgot it. And deep down, I'm going, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> she forgot it. Yay, because if it's here, I know I'm not going to have a bite. I'm going to consume it all at one time with one cup of coffee. I don't need that in my life, right? So don't buy, or another way, don't buy the lures that can attract you in your life. Or maybe you need to go from the smartphone back to the old school Nokia <laughs> block phone, which you can't do anything from it, but may maybe you do need to cancel the subscription. I mean, maybe you do need to block certain old friendships from your social media and toss out the phone where those old connections can't come back to lure you. Amen or ouch. This is what Jesus is talking about. You may say, pastor, that's crazy. Well, uh, gouge out your eye and throw it out, cut off your hand. So this is what Jesus is getting at. He's saying take some radical, radical moves in your life. I, I read this years, uh, years ago, I think, this autobiography in four, five short chapters by Portia Nelson. If you've heard it, just play along. If not, you're going to love it. It fits right here. Watch this. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. 
I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I still don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there, and I still fall in. <laughs> it's a habit. It's my fault. I know where I am. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down a different street. <laughs> so it's radically altering our daily lives to walk down a different street. Now, you may say this, because this is what I would say if I'm sitting there where you are. I'd be like, Pastor, that sounds great, but really, Nokia? I use my phone for my work, check my emails. Pastor, really drive down a different road so I don't go past the store? That's the only road I have to get home. What do we do? That's my workplace. I know there are lures, but I, I, I have no choice. It's my work. Those are great questions. I'm glad you're asking those questions because I have an answer. <laughs> Better than that, the Lord has an answer. Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in every, any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So it's, you can't avoid the lure, right? You can't avoid the lure. You go to school or you have a roommate, go to work, colleague. You got to pass the store on the way home. There's no route B and it's there. And when the craving and the Lord gets there, you turn your eyes from it to Christ and say, you give me strength. I don't need this to cope. I need you to cope, Christ Jesus, my heart. You are worthy and worth it. This is, this is I hear it right now. It's jink, Jesus is jingling, and it's <laughs> waving, and it's really loud. But you know what? I'm just going to speak your word louder. I'm going to pray louder that you're my victory and you're my freedom. <laughs> because you are enough, and I am content, and I don't need this. Yeah. But you may say, that sounds like a very boring life, Pastor. Sounds like there's no fun. Sounds like there's no pleasure. Listen, John Piper said it. God is not a killjoy. He's just against what kills your joy. And in the end, for anyone to hear a sermon like this and reflect on their lives and pleasures and habits and addictions and obsessions and go, that's where the life is. I'm going, really? In the pit? In the tar? Looking at your, your, the altar of blood of what it's cost you? And that's missing out. Listen, we need to get past FOMO, the fear of missing out, to JOMO, the joy of missing out. Because that's what God has for us. So it's not looking back on these things. It's looking back and go, that was, not, that was not fun. That was not a living. That was a killer. I'm going to reorient my day to Christ. And then the final, the, final, the final step is this, to walk in the light. Walk in the light. God has a light out over the tar pit, so you have to walk into it. And it's the walk to live in his light. John chapter 15, Jesus is with his disciples, and to cut to the chase, he says, here are three ways to abide in me, as you kind of pull it out. He talks about abiding, remaining in him, and it's through the scriptures, through prayer, and in community. So it's getting in the scriptures and getting the scriptures in you. It's, it's meditating on the scriptures, letting it run into your heart, run through your veins, prayer, inner, prayer, prayer. Pray without ceasing. You know, it's just a, you have a consciousness of God and praying with him and then community, which we've already talked about. But here's a very specific way to walk in the light, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's walking in the light. 
And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you can't do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, there's your sign. There's your sign. (laughs) I I was, uh, I ran across the meme this week about signs and obstacles and that kind of thing. Here's what this meme said. It says, every time I pray God send a sign, I think I'll just wait for a signier sign. (laughs) That's true. A signier sign. A bigger obstacle in which to reorient my day, a bigger sign to show me where the light is when God's already revealed it. This thankfulness of the heart. Someone once said that the struggle ends where gratitude begins. It's on the same same way. See, that's attitude talk. It's mind talk, attitude, gratitude, thankfulness, everything. I want to see Christ in it is worthy and worth it. Attitude, because your attitude can take you to the pit. Another way to walk in the light is don't run from hardship. We all face hardships. Our families do. We do on a personal level. Don't run from it. When you have Christ Jesus in your life, he's got some things. He's going to walk with you, and he's got some things maybe to reveal to you. Watch the way it's expressed here in Romans chapter 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You know, sometimes we just need a break, but what God wants for you and me is a breakthrough. And so we look at, okay, so that means my hardship right now is preaching a sermon to me. And what is it saying? It's saying that I can build endurance. I can become stronger for this. I can have greater integrity and character by navigating this with Christ Jesus. Here's what happens. If you're going through a hardship in your life, if you're going through a suffering season in your life, And instead of turning to Jesus, you turn to a behavior or a way or a substance. You are now in formaldehyde. You are stuck emotionally. You are stuck spiritually. And oh, by the way, the problem never goes away. So why formaldehyde and be stuck emotionally and spiritually, even relationally, whereas if you trust Jesus to have all of your heart out of your life. You can trust he's making me stronger in this. I'm growing in character through this. I'm growing closer to him in this. So don't run. That's called walking in the light. Don't run. And then one last thought on this. Be careful that whatever behavior or way, or whatever you've turned to or I've turned to to cope, be careful in the sense that you've, you've sought to put it away and put it away but you go through moments where you look back and you miss it. You miss him or you miss her or you miss it or you miss that. And so you turn back and it's almost sentimental. You look back and you kind of, like, like it was a good thing. There, there's a place in the Old Testament that gives us a glimpse of this. So God's people were delivered out of Egypt where they were brutally, brutally beat down. And God delivered them, but they had to go through the wilderness because he had some teaching for them. They had to grow and be strengthened and trust. Well, they started complaining, and they started missing Egypt that just abused them. So let me show it to you. Exodus 16.3, And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread and ate bread to the full. <laughs> So they're looking back, and they're going, yeah, sure, 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 they were putting us to death. Sure, they were beating us to death. Sure, they were torturing us unbelievably. Sure, they were threatening our families. Sure, they were killing our children, but mmm, those bagels. (laughs) Remember those bagels? Boy, those bagels were good. Isn't that silly? We laugh at that, don't we? But that's what we do. We start missing what was torturing us. What was beating us down? We look back and we miss it. What are we doing? We've got to walk in the light of Christ Jesus. Some of you come so far. You've, get, you've been given a rough deck, even in you know, predispositions and, and even choices you've made or choices you haven't made that were made at you or for you. Or, there can be a lot there that you carry, but you've come so far. It doesn't mean this tar tar pit's going to go away, and it doesn't mean you're going to walk across it. It doesn't mean you're going to fall into it. It doesn't mean you're going to stop and sink again. But I want to call you to not give up. I want to call you to the fact that God is for you, 
And you, can, you don't have to let it defeat you and keep you down and ask, what's the point? You can be like the prophet here in Micah. Watch this. He's in the tar pit. Watch out what he says. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. Don't rejoice over me, my bad habit. Don't rejoice over me, my substance. Don't re rejoice over me, the addiction and all that I turn to to cope. Rejoice not over me, my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him, meaning my, my actions have real consequences, until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He's for me. He's for me. He will bring me out to the light. He will bring me out to the light, and I shall look upon his vindication, meaning this does not and will not ever define me. Amen. Yeah. So I was in Alabama this summer my, where I grew up, and I have an uncle, a very wise uncle. we have been close to him growing up, and he said something that I thought of in this message for, for all of us, and it's this right here. Never stop starting over. Never stop starting over. So... My plea for you in this message was that no one, maybe you were confronted, maybe you were challenged, maybe you were convicted, but I pray not shamed, I pray not guilted, but I pray you heard love and love enough to be told the truth. And that you hear in the end that it's about God's grace, your grit and others' grip. And you can give up the tar pit, you can reach out from the tar pit to know he takes you. And if that means right now, praise God right now. If you leave and you go and you stumble again, never stop starting over. Step, reach back out. Rejoice not over me, my enemy. I will rise. God's grace, your grit, and others' grip. So here's what we get to do. We get to go from asphalt pit to baptismal pool today at all of our campuses. Isn't that good? So we've had baptisms all day at our campuses, and we've seen so many people come at each of our campuses, and it's beautiful. And this is your moment. If you've never been baptized, if you are born again and you've never been baptized, that's the first. If, you, if you've ever been born again, you go, what now? Well, here's the what now. Jesus said, repent, be baptized. Repent, be baptized. So this is your first step of obedience if you've never been baptized and you are born again. This is it. You might say, well, I was baptized as an infant. Doesn't count. Uh, you, you didn't place your faith in Jesus as an infant. It wasn't a choice. This is a choice that you're following Jesus. So if, you're, if, you've, if you've never been baptized, this is your moment. If you, if you say, I, I didn't come ready. Oh, we're ready for you. We've had people baptized in their clothes. We have a change of clothes for you. You can go back and get changed and we'll be here for you. So as God stirs in you, just as God can put obstacles in our ways, he can lead us in deep ways. And maybe he's leading you for such a time as this at all of our campuses. Let's pray, and our lead pastors will give direction. Lord, thank you for all who are here, and I pray this message has reminded us to never stop starting over, that your grace is sufficient, divine enablement to serve us, to help us, coupled with our grit and others' grip in our lives. Help our unbelief. Thank you for the victory we can find in you. Bless these precious people in the victory you've begun and will continue on. Thank you for those who will be baptized today. May you be glorified in it and may our hearts be stirred and encouraged in Christ at the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And I pray this in Jesus' name and we all said, amen, amen. amen.